Hi there, and welcome to my channel. I've been away for a while, so if you're new here, thanks for stopping by. If you've been here before, then thanks so much for sticking around so long. Today we're going to be talking about something I'm really passionate about, storytelling. On my channel, we've discussed ways to make our storytelling better, analyzed great examples and some not-so-great ones from pop culture history, and studied the art of what makes a story great. For some time now, mainstream storytelling has been on a sharp decline. That's part of the reason I started this channel, to learn from our past and be the best we can be. Lately, though, I fear the situation has become a little more dire. Storytelling, at least as a mass market consumption of our culture, is dying. Let's explore this and see what we can do to change it. To understand why this is such an issue, it's first important to understand why storytelling matters so much. We could attack this from so many angles, such as the sociological standpoint that storytelling is a reflection of our culture. We could talk about how living in the shadow of the Cold War and the constant threat of nuclear annihilation gave us the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, the Hulk, Spider-Man, great B-movies like Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, and literary classics such as Ian Fleming's James Bond or Tom Clancy's, well, everything by Tom Clancy for the most part. We could talk about the importance of storytelling from a psychological perspective, how the stories of our culture are also models of our social mores. What we call a hero is not necessarily the same as what another culture might call a hero. What we model in our stories tell our cultural beliefs, a shared understanding of the rules. If a side character is a jerk in a movie, what is he modeling for us that makes him be viewed that way? What is he telling us through his words, body language, and his relationship to the other characters? Why should we dislike those traits? Likewise, what makes a villain or a hero? What makes a romance? Why is this love so pure and beautiful and another love story is considered trashy? In the end though, why it matters is everything I've mentioned here and more. Without storytelling, we have no plays, no books, no movies, no interpretive dance, no professional wrestling. I don't want to live in a world where we can't see a plucky underdog become a hero through the power of an atomic elbow off the top rope. I shudder to think of it, actually. Our stories unify us. I'm not sure if you've taken a look outside your window lately, but we could really use some of that right now. People don't know their neighbors. Communities are places that you live rather than something you're a part of. There's never been a point in my life that I've ever seen all of us more divided. Unfortunately, our stories are starting to reflect that lack of cohesion and shared sense of common ground. So, let's ask the question. Let's start with the elephant in the room. Reading books is now a niche. With the advent of 2,000 channels, streaming services, and social media, reading is the domain of fewer and fewer people, and that only stands to get worse as time goes on. So. If we're going to get a sense of how bad storytelling has gotten, we need to look at the stories that most people are consuming. So, let's go to the movies. Of the top 10 highest grossing films of 2023, four of them were sequels to existing franchises. Of the remaining six, another four of them are based on existing stories or properties, those being Barbie, Super Mario Brothers, Wonka, and The Little Mermaid. That leaves Oppenheimer, a historical biopic, and Elemental. Elemental is literally the only original story that's not just in the top 10, but the top 20 of last year. Every other film is either a remake, sequel, reboot, or a film adaptation of an existing property. To put that in perspective, studios spent tens to hundreds of millions of dollars per film, made billions in return, and only greenlit one original story that could break the top 20. Now. You could say that that's just because Hollywood's become so risk-averse that they won't greenlight anything that hasn't got a proven, built-in fan base that'll fill seats on opening weekend, and you'd be partly right. But money isn't everything, and in this case, it doesn't tell the whole story. Out of those top 20 highest-grossing films of 2023, only five of them are even in the list of Rotten Tomatoes' 20 highest-reviewed films of 2023. As a matter of fact, number three, Killers of the Flower Moon, another historical film that was categorically loved by both critics and filmgoers, comes in all the way at 37 in gross. What exactly does this tell us? Well, it doesn't spell out the whole picture, but it is starting to show a trend that's pretty disturbing. The stories we are telling that are truly powerful and resonate with audiences don't make a lot of money. 
that part isn't necessarily new. A Few Good Men, one of the most iconic courtroom dramas since 12 Angry Men, was number 10 at the box office the year that it came out. Number 1 was Jurassic Park. Action and dinosaurs put butts in seats. Here's the problem. A majority of people that have seen it love A Few Good Men. People also love Jurassic Park. When you say that the highest grossing films of the year aren't the ones with the best audience scores, that means that everyone went to the theater with high hopes, but didn't like what they came out with. When you look at 2023, you have films like Barbie, The Little Mermaid, Fast X, and Wonka. Each and every one of these films are big moneymakers, but wildly divisive in reviews, all for various reasons. Fast X is teetering on the last bit of goodwill that the existing fans have left. While The Little Mermaid's casting was controversial, Barbie's message was hyper-political, and the audience seems pretty split as to whether Wonka should have existed at all. If we as a culture can't even agree on what good stories are, if we spend our money on high-grossing, well-advertised films only to leave the feel theater feeling that we wasted our time, if we're not enjoying ourselves collectively, what does that say about us as a people? Have we become so fractured in our little ideological groups that we can't see each other as Americans anymore? I'd actually go so far as to say no, even as all signs point to this being the issue, even as every mainstream news outlet will put up countless pundits to tell you that that is the problem. It's not that we're so divided that we can't find common ground and common stories anymore. The problem is that we're being told to be so divided that we can't find common ground. With every new film, we're essentially being given a trolley problem, and we're being forced to pick a side that is objectively the most moral, when this isn't a moral question at all. Morality plays are built upon universal truths in their storytelling. There isn't anything universally true about who is playing Ariel. There isn't anything universally true about whether a toy should be raised up as a feminist icon. There absolutely isn't any universal truth to be garnered from the backstory of a fictitious candy maker whose part in their story was already told. And that leads me to our first real problem that we have to confront to solve this. I'm going to be real honest with you folks. I was pretty torn up about the whole Writers Guild strike in Hollywood. On one hand, greedy corporations and studios have an obligation to pay a fair wage, especially when it comes to the people that make the backbone of a movie or show happen. I also feel that AI is a genuine concern that writers have every good reason to look at getting certain protections built into their contracts going forward. That's just good common sense. However, there is the other side of the coin. What passes for writing in 2024 is absolute trash. For years now, We've been subjected to countless remakes, almost an entire phase of the Marvel Cinematic Universe you could throw in the garbage and no one would miss it, and films so purposefully crafted to cause controversy and deliver messages that they forgot they were supposed to have a cohesive narrative in there somewhere. So my sympathies for the Writers Guild strike was something akin to a burglar telling me that I need to replace my security system. I really appreciate the message and all, but I just wish it wasn't them delivering it. Of course, I believe writers deserve a fair wage, just not these writers. You see, the biggest problem about Wonka, for example, isn't that no one asked for it, that it's a soulish cash-in on nostalgia for a simpler time, that they cast Timothy Chalamet, nor the bizarre CGI of Hugh Grant as an Oompa Loompa. No, the real problem is that no one writing the film had one-tenth of the grasp on what made the original so great. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is not Willy Wonka's story, it's Charlie's. The universal truth of this book and film is that Charlie put his own virtue above short-term gains. Even when Wonka was loud and cruel and dismissed him, even when Charlie was the last person standing and was told he'd still lose his golden opportunity anyway, he chose to do the right thing and give back the candy that Wonka's rival wanted stolen. Because of this, He's given the factory and all the treasures that come with it. It is literally a morality play that extols the virtue of honesty. That's it. You can boil the whole theme of the story down to that one sentence. Willy Wonka could be a bear running the factory. Charlie could be 25 years old. It doesn't matter. The core universal truth of the film wouldn't change. Compare this against Wonka and you see very clearly what I mean. 
it's a convoluted mess of trying to have Timothy Chalamet be a younger version of the Gene Wilder performance of the character, mixing in this silly candy from the original film with even more magical elements than the first one had, and telling a story of how Wonka saved himself and a group of others from the nefarious people that he was staying with, and also the chocolate cartels in town. Oh yeah, and then... He finds a place to start a factory at the end. You remember that? You remember? It was a chocolate factory, like the one you know? There's a whole lot of remember this going on in these prequels. A blatant attempt to connect a far weaker story to one people remember more fondly. And it's not even a crutch at this point. It's become baked into the formula to now explain things and connect things even no one cares about. Like how a character got their iconic vest or something. It's standing on the shoulders of giants without a clue how you got there. In order for us to be great storytellers, we have to first understand what universal truth our story is trying to tell. It's not important that you put this on page one, paragraph one of your story. If anything, there's far too much messaging and exposition going on in the stories we're consuming these days. For example, if I were to tell you the theme or the truth that I'm trying to tell in my new horror novel, In Shadows, it would actually be a massive spoiler. At the same time, though, I knew what I was telling before I ever put the pen to paper. This keeps your story tight and it informs your writing. A universal truth is something that we can all agree on culturally, something that the vast majority of us will find objectively true regardless of our individual experiences. Love is beautiful. Justice will prevail. Be kind always, even when it's hard. Honesty is its own reward. Even negative universal truths can be compelling. Breaking up is hard, sometimes too hard to bear. War is hell. And so on. There is an alarming list of checkboxes writers seem to be scrambling to tick before a piece of work is considered suitable for modern audiences. When it's done, it hits the screen or the page, and surprise surprise, it flops horribly. The only thing left to do is blame the audience. I mean, sure, as a writer, I did everything right. I made this work inclusive and full of diversity and representation matters, right? There's something here for everyone that everyone can identify with. So if you didn't like it, that must be a reflection on you, the audience, with all your filthy biases and bigotry. You hear about it all the time. Look at this quote. Look, people have to buy tickets to this movie too. This movie has to make money. If this movie doesn't make money, it reinforces a stereotype in Hollywood that men can't go see women and do action movies. In a vacuum, this quote sounds like a dangerous and alarming trend. I mean, a stereotype is based on a long-standing image that clusters a complex group into a handful of qualities. So, if we reach back in time, we should see that stereotype on display, right? Except it's literally never been true. Women haven't only been in action movies, they've been in top 20 box office blockbusters since the birth of modern film. We're only talking about action movies here. So we're not even including other genres with female leads, like the year Titanic was number one, or 2023 when Barbie was number one. That said, representation does matter, just not the way studio executives are telling us it does. For good storytelling, it is imperative that we tell our story from the most interesting character's perspective, and they need to be quintessentially representative of the world they inhabit. Whether that means we see the rise of a young boy entering a wizarding school to become the most powerful and important wizard there, or if we're seeing a man that's a product of the streets rise to power as a criminal kingpin and root against him in the hopes that justice catches up with him. Whether we're watching a man of incredible talent and cold-blooded violence come out of retirement to help those in need, or we find ourselves lost in one man's unquenchable thirst for power and status, we exalt these characters because they are the best representatives to tell us the story. They are exemplars. Walter White is not a good person, but what made him go from family man to the most wanted person in the country takes five seasons of bad decisions and a deep dive into the underworld of organized crime. His tale is a warning that if we were in the same boat, we might make the same decisions. That doesn't make him right, it makes us wrong. The story warns us not to repeat his mistakes, that it all catches up to us eventually. The same thing is true with Nino Brown in New Jack City, 
He was never going to stop consuming money and ruining lives and causing pain. And he's the best person to tell us his side of the story. Harry Potter is a blank slate in every man when the series starts. He is introduced to the world of wizarding the same as we are. So who better to tell the tale and bring us up to speed? And the Equalizer? Come on. A man of exceptional training and questionable past that is willing to use all of his power to destroy gangs that prey on their own people? Who else could tell that story? So, representation, regardless of gender, skin color, age, or sexual orientation, is really important, as long as what they're representing is the character in the world. What virtues do they hold? What character flaws must they overcome? Or how do they get swallowed by them? Are they the best representative of their world, or would someone else be more interesting? What we do not need is to see ourselves in characters. I am not a government-trained killer. I am not African-American. I am not 69 years old. That doesn't mean I don't want to go and see Equalizer 3. I did spend my money, and I loved every second of it. The movie would not have been better for me in any way if it shoehorned a 40-something autistic white dude that likes to talk about books and movies. I don't need that. I need a compelling story. I need someone else's story. Maybe I can relate. Maybe I can't. Relating to it doesn't reflect whether I enjoy it or not. So let's take some of what I've mentioned so far and try to understand the controversy over last year's The Little Mermaid. Yeah, I know. What fun, right? You literally can't discuss this film without having to pick a side on the political aisle. Well, let's try not to anyway. Honestly, I find the political discussion around the movie really quite boring, on both sides, and it's been beaten to death on that front. So, let's instead ask some very crit critical questions from a storytelling perspective. The story itself was written by Hans Christian Andersen, in Danish, back in 1837. So, it's a Danish story from the mind of a Danish author living in the 19th century. Disney came along the first time and changed the darker parts of the story to suit a G-rated young children's audience 152 years later. In this version, the original story's morality play of virtue even unto death is replaced by one mermaid's desire to live in a world that's not her own and find love there. So much so that she would defy her father, make a deal with a witch, and try to manipulate a guy into falling in love with her. If, if it sounds like I'm being critical, I'm not. Really, I'm not. I recognize that some of the nuance of this storytelling is lost on children, and I'm looking at it through the cynical eye of eyes of an aforementioned 40-something autistic writer. It's a beloved children's classic. I know that, and I accept it. Now, let's flash forward to 2023, and the iconic red-headed Disney princess is replaced by someone of a different race. On its surface, the arguments either for or against are mostly racially based or political, and as I said, we don't care about that. We need to dig a little deeper. First of all, who is this story for? The intended audience matters a lot when you're trying to figure out how to blow a $240 million budget. At least it does if you want to make your money back. Spoiler alert, this film barely broke even. So, let's say that we want to bring in the exact same audience that we did the first time. Little girls brought in by their parents generically. Well, this is a live action rehash of the exact same film made in 1989, right? So, why would it look different? Gone is the Danish mermaid that sacrifices herself rather than cause harm in 1837, and now, gone is the red-headed mermaid of 1989. So, if the new writers don't agree with or like the original material, why are people that don't like the material writing a remake? Are these writers somehow better? Are we, as an audience, now wrong for liking the original, but saved by forsaking it and adopting the new version? It's a very mixed message to be sending out there. Secondly, if the purpose is representation of race, so that a child can see someone that looks like them on screen, then why this one in particular? Why make a retelling of a Danish story turn Disney princess cartoon and market it to a different race? Are we saying that the origin of the story, its time and place and geographical location doesn't matter? Worse, if we're saying that the Danish plot of a Danish story can be swapped for a person of African-American descent, does that mean that the Danish inspiration doesn't matter? 
even more frightening, are we saying that African American stories are interchangeable with Danish ones, that they don't have or need their own stories told because they can just be swapped with stories that are proven successful? That Ariel could be any woman of any race at any location in history? Does the origin of the story matter at all? If it doesn't matter, then what part of the story does? Is there a universal truth or some morality play that's unfolding here that has no other equivalent? Basically, what I'm asking is, why is this particular story so important to change the casting on? And when I ask that question, I ask the same of any story that fleshes out a morality play or fable. Is the main character important? Could it have been anyone else? Invariably, the answer for most classic novels and films over the past few decades has always been no. These characters are iconic in both appearance and in their lore. To see the Ghostbusters patch is to invoke the brown suits, Bill Murray's dry wit, and Slimer. The icons and memes that come from great stories are tied to those stories. To change the icon is to change our shared understanding or interpretation of the story. We no longer share the Little Mermaid, we share a Little Mermaid. And which mermaid is it is anyone's guess. Is it the Danish one? The Disney cartoon one? The live action one? Is one better than the other? And if so, am I wrong for feeling that way? Or was it wrong to make me choose at all? Unfortunately, this is just another example of the hollowing out of our culture. It's taking our stories away, even the ones we already shared. In its place, nothing new has been created. We're not turning a B-movie classic into a suspenseful and unforgettable horror film. In modern remakes, the spirit of the original is given a bunch of remember that moments, but the soul of the story is lost. We get nothing out of it. We sing the old songs that have been pitch corrected on a computer, and we read the script written by much better writers of another time, and make no money for our studio, and create a bunch of controversy that makes people say bitter and angry things to one another, and then go hide in the safety of their own camp. Instead of the purpose of storytelling, sharing our values in common culture, we've only succeeded at dividing it further. In order to address this question, I have one answer above all things. Right. Every single person listening to this has a unique experience in this life, one that only you can see. Go out there and tell the damn truth as you see it. The only thing that we can do as writers is fight all the bad storytelling with a wave of good. This might ruffle a lot of feathers, but I don't believe in writing to market. If your sole goal in this life is to churn out book after book, giving the exact same audience more and more of exactly what you think they want, regardless of your own declining quality, then you're not an author. You're a fast food chain. For every masterpiece of dystopian fear, carefully balanced with religious overtones that becomes the modern version of the Ragnarok story, there's about five books about scary sentient cars. We can do better. For right or wrong, I don't stay confined to my lane. I've written comedy, fantasy, horror, and sci-fi. I write stories that mean something to me. Themes and characters only I can write. Stories only those characters can tell. And when I'm done, I'm done. And it's on to the next project that inspires me. You know, not for nothing, but Kurt Vonnegut wasn't called a science fiction writer in his heyday. At one point, that was actually an insult in the literary community. He was just called a writer and a master at that. Granted, these days, Slaughterhouse-Five and Cat's Cradle and even the short story that became Harrison Bergeron are all what we'd lovingly refer to as classic science fiction. But back then, it was a different story. Speculative fiction, groundbreaking science, fear of the bomb. The most uncertain times for us as Americans culturally all took place when his greatest works were written. Tell me that you, as a writer in 2024, don't have your own fears, your own speculation about the future of technology, and concerns about the wild swings in our divisive culture that are there to inspire you. As consumers, though, I'd like to think the pendulum is already swinging back in the other direction, but there's still work to do. Unfortunately, it's more the same of what we've been doing, and that's don't show up. Don't get in line for a movie ticket or a new novel if it's painfully obvious that anything besides storytelling is taking place. If someone tries to tell you how inclusive they are or how diverse their cast is, instead of telling you what the confrontation is at the heart of the story, run in the other direction. There is hope here. Studios are already beginning to feel it in the pocketbooks and changing course. The real problem is much deeper than that, though. 
We as storytellers have to be able to see the forest for the trees. The problem is not that a bunch of suits and studios once greenlit these bloated films and lost money on them. The problem truly is those people that are writing them. These are the same creatives that are still going to be relied upon to write these course corrected films that we'll see two years from now. And make no mistake, they're still going to be using activism and division as the primary principles by which they pen their scripts. If you think this is over yet, it isn't. That said, don't be afraid to be optimistic either. I still show up at the theater for turn off your brain action movies like the upcoming Godzilla and King Kong movie. I still spend my money to support long historical dramas like Killers of the Flower Moon or Oppenheimer. I still waste my money on A24 films like Midsummer, hoping for fresh ideas and walking out realizing I just watched a three hour version of The Wicker Man. The point is, whether I loved it or hated it, I had to try. But these blatant big budget blockbusters need to return to the act of telling stories before they're ever going to get another penny from me. I won't have my nostalgia for property veiled around empty, convoluted, heavily messaged stories anymore. Any studio that wants my trust in their franchises has to earn it back. So the answer is pretty simple, and it can be boiled down to this. Write the stories only you can write, and support the writers that do the same. Avoid and protest everything else. If we can be united on that front, maybe we can start coming together on a few other viewpoints too. Maybe then we could dare to hope for a new renaissance of storytelling. Thanks so much for listening. Check out my channel if you haven't been here in a while. I just did a first chapter reading of my horror novel In Shadows, which is on sale on Amazon, both in ebook and paperback. Check out the li link in the description below. I'll be doing first chapter readings of all my novels in the coming weeks, so stay tuned for that. I'm not a professional book reader, so your feedback on my readings is very much appreciated. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. Every little bit helps. Now, have fun and get crafting.